Amen. All right, looks like some people are starting to uh, log back on here uh, for our worship service this morning. And uh, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And so thankful for that testimony, even to be a, uh, an eyewitness to those events um, along with um, Dr. Kuyper and uh, just, just from, a, from a distance, of course. And um, so grateful for what the Lord is doing, uh, even here in 2021. And yes, uh, I am quarantined. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I've uh, been, been jailed in my office for uh, two weeks. Uh, no, just kidding. Just a few days. Uh, Judah came down with uh, COVID, and it's uh, going through our family, of course. And we're just trying to take bets who's going to get it next. But he is doing well. He had a bad day a couple of days ago. But um, thankfully, uh, he has asthma, so be in prayer for him. And um, he seems to be doing a little bit better. But we all have to quarantine. Uh, we've contacted the people that uh, were exposed to uh, to me, at least. Uh, of course, our other son uh, had it as well, uh, Elijah. And so it's just kind of going through the family. But here I am quarantined. We're trying something new to continue our series in the gospel of mark i hope it's working i do see those at home watching and so grateful for uh you know the leadership at city on a hill church uh, the story must go on jesus must continue forward and he will uh, he said uh, if i am lifted up uh, i will draw all men to myself and that's what we're doing or trying to do at City on a Hill Church, uh, whether we're with you physically or not, uh, whether our leadership is, uh, is, is out of town or not. Grateful for Paul Rather filling in for um, Pastor Bill uh, and, uh, and Perry who are out on a much needed break. You know, I think, I think uh, Pastor Bill, this may be like the second weekend in, in two years, maybe the second or third weekend in two years that he's taking a break. And I'm so thankful that uh, he he's taking a break. Hopefully he's getting some good needed rest. Um, but but he's like the Energizer Bunny. He just keeps on keeping on. And uh, what what a, what a joy to work alongside him and all the great people there over on Commerce Street uh, worshiping uh, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And um, that story and testimony is important because it fits the passage for today. We're going to be in Mark chapter five. And um, we're going to be talking about the garrison demoniac. And so hopefully you'll have that story of Dr. Kuyper's in the back of your mind and in your heart. And this, this will just kind of leap off the page here and encourage you in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, this chapter is an incredible chapter. This chapter has the, uh, the restoration of a demon-possessed man. There is a woman who is healed from a hemorrhage. And Jairus' daughter is resurrected from the dead. Some, some scholars call this the St. Jude chapter of the New Testament. And, uh, you know, in Roman Catholicism, St. Jude is the patron saint, actually, of hopeless causes. And I'm pretty sure that's why Danny Thomas, uh, over there in Memphis, Tennessee, named his hospital the founder of all that, uh, St. Jude Hospital, because they would be treating supposedly incurable diseases for children. And so scholars call this the St. Jude chapter of the New Testament. But here's the reality with King Jesus. The hopeless causes of chapter 5 in the Gospel of Mark, and now even in our country, seems like there's a lot of hopelessness in our country, and in the church in the United States for sure, they're not so hopeless when Jesus shows up on the scene, when Jesus shows up on the scene, hope is here. Hope has arrived. But it, there's still some questions, right? There's always questions when it comes to hopelessness, especially with these stories. Scholars wonder, why in the world did the Holy Spirit inspire the authors of Matthew, Mark, and Luke to write this particular story, to include this particular story in their gospel accounts? Some like to believe it's it's to see how God can restore the the mind or the psychology of a person and bring them to psychological tranquility in our souls, which he does, and he and he does for this individual as well. But when you read John chapter twenty, verse thirty one, you start to understand why this story is in the Gospel of Mark 
and even Matthew and Luke for that matter. In John 20, 31, the Apostle John, the best friend of Jesus, wrote this. These accounts are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. And that applies to every word of the gospel narratives. Every word of it. In other words, Jesus calming the storm where we left off in chapter 4. Jesus healing a woman. Jesus resurrecting a child. And yes, Jesus casting out a demon are there to reveal the character of Christ in his deity, majesty, and power. And let me tell you, right now in the United States, demonology is hotter than ever. Demonology, the study of, of demons, the talking about the spirit world and, and, and spiritual warfare is hotter than ever. Uh, you know, and this, this happens every once in a while. It's amazing how we uh, forget how often we talk about the end of the world and the powers that be and spiritual warfare. I mean, it wasn't long ago, back in 2000, we were afraid of Y2K and the end of the world happening. And this kind of pops up when things start to go uh, south in our lives, if you, if you will. Uh, but there's a caution there. You you can uh, be so consumed, you can be so consumed with demonology or the spirit realm uh, that you elevate it to a point that the Bible never elevates it. But I'm also reminded of a quote from a movie uh, where the uh, main character said, the greatest trick that the devil ever pulled was to convince the world that he didn't exist. And there's a lot of truth to that. The greatest trick that the uh, devil ever pulled was to convince the world that he doesn't exist. In our Bible, we believe uh, that the spirit uh, realm is, is real, angels and demons. We believe, though, that God is more powerful than any of them. And uh, we're going to see that in our passage today. And uh, boy, do we need to hear this today, especially in our land and time. What, what are these stories of Jesus calming the storm and restoring this man have to do with us in the first place? And here's the common theme or the, or the common thread between Jesus and the waves and the wind that are threatening to destroy Jesus and his disciples in chapter 4. And now these demons from hell who are threatening to destroy this man's life in chapter 5. What's the common thread? And here's the common thread. When Jesus shows up, he overcomes the chaos. When Jesus shows up, he overcomes the chaos of the winds and the waves. He overcomes the chaos of these demons from hell. And the reality is, he's been doing it ever since the beginning of time. If you remember in the book of Genesis, in the creation account, the Bible tells us the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And God said, let there be light. The eternal, all-knowing, all-powerful, ever-present God triumphed over chaos from the beginning. And centuries later, I mean way later, the Apostle John, the best friend of Jesus, wrote in his gospel, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. In other words, John is crediting Jesus as the agent of that cosmic creation. The Apostle Paul picks up on that a little bit later in his letters. <clears throat> and he says in Romans eleven thirty six, And of him and through him and to him are all things. Jesus the Son, along with the Father and the Holy Spirit, possess the power to calm the chaos wherever he encounters it. And that is good news for our souls today. Mercy. Even, even non-Christian scientists know this to be true. Non-Christian scientists understand this principle of order over chaos. When they look at the universe and they study the universe and the world around us, <clears throat> they assume 
that the world is a cosmos instead of chaos. In other words, they wouldn't even be able to study the world if there weren't fixed principles ordering the world or and the universe. All scientists assume, Christian or non-Christian, all scientists assume the universe is knowable and intelligible. There's this design behind it. They all know it. But thankfully, we know where that order and authority come from, and he has a name. His name is King Jesus. He has authority over the chaos, over nature, and over the chaos of hell itself. That power shows up while they're caught in a boat on the Sea of Galilee in a violent storm. <clears throat> Jesus stands up, he calms the storm, and the disciples are more afraid of Jesus after the storm than they were afraid of the winds and the wave. waves. Now, they, they make it to the other side of the sea, to the Gadarenes, and uh, boy, they had a surprise waiting for them. Most scholars are unsure exactly where this took place. Uh, there was a town southeast of there called Gadara, and there was a town called uh, Gerasa, and then there's there's a lot of uh, you know different variants of that particular particular word, if you will. Um, but most likely, after some archaeological finds in 1970, it seems that this event took place just to the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee in a village called Cursa, which was a village among what we call Decapolis, or ten cities. And so you can envision Jesus calming the storm, the disciples go with them across to the eastern side, they come to this village of Cursa, uh, the area of the Gadarenes, uh, among the ten cities there in Decapolis, and all of a sudden, this man comes running up towards them. Th this man who is from a Gentile area with Roman garrisons all around them, uh, and Jesus gets out of the boat, and boom, here we go on land. It just never ends. And Mark tells us in Mark chapter 5, Jesus encounters a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs. Can you imagine the looks on the faces of these Jewish men when an unclean Gentile from a Gentile country runs up to them and approaches these Jews whose worst fear was to be declared unclean in the sight of God? Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy are absolutely packed with laws and, and rules and procedures for dealing uh, with these kinds of, of things. And, uh, you know, you, you think quarantining, you know, for 10 to 14 days uh, is, is rough. If you were to touch the movable frame of a coffin, you were declared unclean. If you touch the gravestone, of someone, you were declared unclean. And every time you touch the accoutrements of the dead, you would have to add seven more days in order to purify yourself ceremonial, ceremonially from this unclean state, if you will. Uh, so you don't touch those things. So by the time the New Testament rolls around, Possession by an unclean spirit was off the charts unclean. Off the charts unclean. And this poor soul was miserable. And he was unclean in four ways. Uh, he, he not only had an unclean spirit, the Bible says that he had a host of them. More than one. Number two, he lived among the tombs among the dead. I mean, this is the worst place to live in the eyes of of a Jew. His his bed was a graveyard. Number three, the graveyard was in an unclean territory that was Gentile territory. No person, I'm telling you, uh, rivals rivals this man in, in misery. Moreover, number four, he lived next to some folks that raised pigs for a living. 
And Jews were not supposed to eat pork. Too bad for them, right? They would have hated the southern United States where we eat pork with just about everything, right? Pulled pork, barbecue, sandwiches, and bacon. How could they not have bacon? But according to Leviticus 11.7, they could not be around pigs. This man slept next to pig farmers, if you will. And, and nobody rivals this man's misery, maybe except Job. Job went through the ringer, no doubt, in the Old Testament. But this poor man was tormented every waking moment by the focus power of hell itself. Mark says here that he had his dwelling among the tombs. Poor fella, he had no human contact, willingly or forcibly. You know, and there's so many people this last year who are alone, they are scared. There's a, an increase in mental health issues. There's an increase in depression. Uh, can you imagine this man's plight where he is all alone? He had friends, but they abandoned him. And he's living among the tombs. When the authorities tried to bind him up, he broke the chains like the Incredible Hulk or Superman. No one could bind this man. No one could tame him. That's the word there actually in the Greek is no one could tame this man like an animal. The word literally tame here means ref they were trying to bind him like a wild beast out in the countryside. There were no kinds of treatment or techniques that worked to help this man. There, were, there was no conversion therapy. There was nothing that was going to work for this man, uh, man-made techniques. Moreover, he was crying out. He was screaming at night in the mountains and among the tombs, and he was cutting himself, kind of like Dr. Kuyper's story. He was cutting himself, which what kids call folks like that, cutters today. He was cutting himself with stones, a chilling scene fit for any horror movie. And in his torment, he would just scream and injure himself, adding misery to misery until a certain man from Nazareth got out of the boat and walked toward him. Everything would change the day he met Jesus, and the man knew it. Mark records that when he saw Jesus from afar, then he ran to him. And when you put the stories together, he ran to him and worshiped Jesus and cried out with a loud voice and said, what have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. I find that ironic, right? <clears throat> These demons are tormenting the man. Jesus shows up and they say, please, Jesus, don't torment us. For he said to him, Jesus said to the man and the demons here, come out of the man, unclean spirit. In Matthew's version of the same story, it reads, have you come here to torment us before the time? That, that's in Matthew's gospel. The Bible makes a distinction between two types of time. Everything that happens in time is historical, right? But not everything that happens in this life is historic. We use the word historic for something very special, for something that is of special significance, right? The exodus of the Israelites, that was historic. The birth of Jesus Christ that we celebrated yet again this Christmas, that was historic, the long-awaited birth of the Savior's advent. And then the demons from hell here in our passage understand that there is another historic moment that is coming. It is on the way where God has appointed a day when Satan and all of his minions all of his forces will be bound and crushed once and for all. His days are numbered. Here's the biblical reality with regard to this truth. The demonic realm lives in constant fear that this day could be any minute. They live in constant fear that this day could be any minute, and that day had not come yet, in our passage, though, 
Jesus still had some work to do through his people. Jesus still was moving towards the cross, as we'll see in the Gospel of Mark. And their day had not come yet, although they were terrified of that day. While their time was not up, one thing, one thing was certainly true about these demons. The demons in our passage of Mark 5 knew who Jesus was. As they addressed him by name, Jesus, the Son of the Most High God. Now, I'm not, I'm not sure what's more incredible: the fact that the demons recognized Jesus and had better, had a better understanding of Jesus than the disciples, had a better theology of Jesus than the disciples, or that a pagan Gentile world did. <clears throat> One of the great discoveries <clears throat> of the 1800s and 1900s with regard to uh, world religions, was that in every culture, in every culture that believed there was a God in, in the rock and in the tree and in the river and in the oven and then in the microwave, there was always a most high God that lived on the other side of the mountain. There was a mightier God who lived on the other side of the mountain. This is incredible. Despite their polytheism and their animism, they maintained a belief of one God who was most high. The Bible talks about this. That truth is written on our hearts. Yet we can suppress the truth in unrighteousness. That's why people worship rocks and trees and rivers and relationships and money and power and you name it. Everyone knows that there's a God who transcends all other gods, who is the most high God. And these demons knew it as well. And they called Jesus by name. Just as the winds and the waves obey Jesus, <clears throat> these demons trembled at his name. The son of the most high God transcends all other gods in his power and authority. And Jesus, in verse 9, asked this man, what is your name? And he answered, my name is Legion, for we are many. Now, a legion, a Roman legion or garrison, if you will, had 5,600 men in that particular troop. Now, that doesn't mean that this man had 5,600 demons in him, but the, the the indication is that this man was tormented by a lot of spirits. This man was absolutely tormented by a host of demons traumatizing this man. And interestingly, though, they were now afraid of Jesus tormenting them in the pit of destruction at the God-ordained time, just like we said. The demons are treating Jesus as their superior, as they are, they are literally begging Jesus. You can kind of envision this conversation going down, right? They are begging Jesus not to send them out of the country. And then Mark writes here in this passage, Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons were begging him, saying, Send us into the swine that we may enter them. They wanted to go into the pigs, you know. I think that says more about the demons than it does the pig, the man, or Jesus. These demons are parasites. They are leeches. They crave to feed on and torment something. They're power hungry. They want to hurt. They never want to heal, obviously. Surprising. Here's what's surprising, though. Jesus says, okay, go ahead. And at once, Jesus gave them permission, the Bible says. These demons cannot do anything that Jesus does not permit them to do. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. And the Bible says there are about 2,000 swine, and the herd ran violently down the steep place or the hill into the sea, and they drowned in the sea. Now, here we go. Before you get all soft for the pigs, 
before you call PETA on Jesus, all right, before you charge Jesus with a lack of compassion or reckless stewardship over the owner's 2,000 pigs, I want to say a couple of things to uh, those watching at home and those there at City on Hill Church on Commerce Street. First of all, Jesus is the Son of God, and he can do whatever he wants to do. If you're the Son of God, you get to call the shots. That's just the way it works, plain and simple. If we don't like his sovereignty, you got to take it up with him. But I would, I would warn you with this. I would advise you to at least fear Jesus as much as the demons did. And go to him humbly with your concerns and questions. Secondly, Jesus in the book of Corinthians is called the second Adam for a reason. In the book of Genesis, God gave Adam authority and dominion to name the animals, to subdue the earth, to have uh, sexual relations with his wife and procreate, make babies, fill the earth. He failed miserably at, at the uh, at the calling and, and duty God gave him. And Jesus shows up on the scene as the second Adam who has authority over everything. So in Jesus' human nature, as the second and better Adam, Jesus had every right to command this event with the pigs. And thirdly, <clears throat> Jesus was not displaying a lack of compassion for the pigs, but a proper compassion for the man. Jesus is saying, this is so important, folks, for, for us here in Mountain Home and City on a Hill Church. Jesus is saying, this human made in the image of God, who is being destroyed day and night by these demons, is worth destroying some pigs in order to save his life. One human life, Jesus is saying, is more important than 2,000 pigs in someone's livelihood. You see, only in a culture of death do people value animals more than humans. We are not just pro-life on this day during Sanctity of Human Life Month. We're not just pro-life for infants here, but we are pro-life for all ages and all races, both genders, male and female, because Jesus says they are worth dying for. They are worth living for and crediting my righteousness to them. And Jesus, that's what it means when the pigs go over the hill. Now, it's not every day you see 2,000 pigs go over the edge of a cliff into the sea, do you? So those in charge of feeding the pigs, the text says, they fled and they told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what it was that had happened. Uh, now we live here in Mountain Home, right? And uh, we understand this in, in, a, in a small area, you know? It, it's amazing how many, uh, you know, people learn about your vacation uh, through various means, right? Oh, so-and-so went on vacation here. This happened to this family. Small towns are like that. Word gets out fast. It travels quickly, right? Word got out, and a large crowd came out to see what had happened. Of course they did. What else do they have to do? Maybe, they're, maybe they were quarantined back then. Who knows? They're bored. They, they came to Jesus, the text says. They came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed, and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. Well, somebody gave the man some clothes. He obviously was naked, and he was sitting there in his right mind. The townspeople saw it. Nobody could deny it. The man who could not be tamed by authorities was calm, sitting down, and in his right mind. The townsfolks, the townspeople, they saw the fruit of Jesus' redemptive touch and work as Jesus did what nobody else could do in rescuing this man from the ravages of hell. And he was in his right mind. 
Never would they have imagined this to happen to this man. That is one of the marks of a, of a true follower of Christ, is that they go from being of unsound mind to sound mind and having a right understanding of God, a right understanding of the Lord. So they all bowed the knee, they began to worship, and they began to evangelize the world, right? Wrong. They were afraid, the text says. Much like the disciples were more afraid of Jesus after the storm, these people were more afraid of Jesus after he healed this man than before. And those who saw it, they, they told others what had happened to this demon-possessed man and about the swine, and then they began to, check this out, they began to plead with Jesus. They began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. Get, get out of here. We don't want you here. We don't want your kind here. You're offending us. You, you know, they're, they're Christ haunted. They've got just enough Jesus now to be inoculated against Jesus. These folks were more afraid of him after the healing than before. And, and why be afraid of Jesus instead of rejoicing that this man was, uh, was restored? These people were confronted by the Holy One of Israel. When the Holy One of God manifests himself in the midst of unholy people, the human response is fear. Man fears. Adam and Eve, when they sinned against the holy God, what did they do? They took, they took leaves and they tried to make man-made clothes to cover up their nakedness, their shame, their guilt. That's what religion does. Religion says, instead of being with Jesus, let's make man-made things to cover up our unholiness. Jesus shows up on the scene. They beg him to leave. Order had entered their chaos. <clears throat> and it exposed their chaotic, wavering hearts like a boat tossed to and fro by the wind and waves of the sea. Please leave. We don't want you here. That's the response of a lost person. So what's the response of a saved person? In great <clears throat> contrast, the man formerly possessed by demons did not want Jesus to go away. That's the mark of a true believer. You don't want Jesus to go away. You don't want Jesus to leave you alone. Rather, he, he wanted to follow Jesus. The demons, the townspeople, they all wanted Jesus to get out of the way. He was messing up their lives. And that's what happens when Jesus, you know, wrecks your life with grace. He turns your life upside down. And these folks wanted Jesus out of there. And they begged him to get out, get out of their lives. But this man, though, chased Jesus to the edge of the sea. And I can see it right now. The text says that when Jesus got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. Be with him. I can see it right now. Jesus is in the boat. The man runs to the edge of the sea. His feet are in the sea. He's holding the bow of the boat. And he's saying to Jesus, please let me follow you. I want to be with you. No one, you saved me. You restored me. I'm new. I can't live without you. I've got to be with you. That's a mark of a true disciple, a person who is changed by Jesus because he or she has been with Jesus and they get Jesus. But here comes a shocker. Whereas Jesus gave the demons permission to go into the swine, he did not give the man permission to follow him. But here's what he said. He said, go home to your friends. Obviously, the man had friends who rejected him. And some of your friends are going to reject you. But for the sake of Jesus, of course. But this guy, he says to him, go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you. Not self-help tips, not a book, not, not religion, not irreligion, not keeping the rules or breaking all the rules. Tell them what the Lord has done for you and how he had compassion on you. And guess what? The man obeyed him 
and took the command to heart. One of the first witnesses to the Lord Jesus Christ was not a Jew, but a Gentile. One of the very first witnesses to who Jesus is was a Gentile convert. And the text says he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him and all marveled. And that's interesting, right? Jesus tells the man, go home and tell your friends what great things the Lord has done for you. And the man goes into to Decapolis and says all the great things that Jesus had done for him. Jesus is Lord and the Lord is Jesus. And they all marveled at this changed man. Thus, the message spread throughout Decapolis and that Gentile region that Jesus, the son of the most high God, can still, with his authority, the very winds and waves of the sea, as well as the chaos of hell itself in your hearts and in your lives. The question is really simple. Do you believe in him today? What storm or chaos is going on in your life, in your hearts right now? The anxiety has never been higher for many people in our country right now. What storm or chaos is going on in your life? Do you know that God in Christ is sovereign over that storm and he can still that storm in your heart? The Bible says to believe in Jesus by faith. That means to trust him with your life. The times are certainly uh, chaotic as evil seems to increase at every turn. Should we panic as Christians? Should we fear as Christians? Should we tremble? And the, an the answer is absolutely not. A time is coming, and maybe it's very soon, when God will wrap this whole thing up as the Son of God arrives in all of his glory on that white horse over the hill with the sunshine of his glory behind him, and he's going to crest that hill and all of his light, and he is going to vanquish the enemies of Satan, sin, and death once for all, for all of eternity. So in confidence and faith, we keep our ears to heaven and we keep our eyes fixed on the Lord Jesus Christ. We listen for the trumpet, but we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the prize of our time and forevermore. Until that day, when we all press forward towards him, who is the prize and the finish line of our race. And lastly, we make much, until that day happens, we make much of Jesus by telling others what great things King Jesus the Lord has done for us. If you love your friends, if you love your family, if you love your coworkers, if you love your teammates, if you love your peers, if you love your students, if you love your country, if you love your, your leaders, if you love your state, the best thing you can do is to go and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you. That's what worship looks like. We're going to log off here in a second, but we love you because Jesus first loved us, and we pray that you will join us, that you will lock arms with us as the Lord leads. Hopefully, I will, I will be out of quarantine in just a couple of days. Um, pray for our family. Pray for one another. I can't wait to see what the Lord is going to do in and through the humble people of City on a Hill Church. We do love you, and may God bless our church, our work of the gospel mission before us, and may he bless your families. God bless.